Becca and Dan, rapid fire intro, here we go. In one to two sentences, who are you? I am a traveler, writer, adventurer, lover of culture, and now I'm a remote worker. I am Dan, coffee drinker, runner, and traveler. Awesome. And and halfhalftravel.com as well. I'll, I'll sh- plug it in there for you guys. That's um, us. That's us. <laughs> and uh, what is your favorite thing about digital nomading? I'll go first. I like that it gives you something to look forward to when you change location, although you might be doing the same type of work. And I like that you can use your surroundings to inspire you for different ideas. My, I, I like being a digital nomad because your surroundings are constantly changing and you're always getting new inspiration wherever you are. And where are you now and what are your two to three favorite cities in the world? And feel free to answer each of you guys if you want. Okay. Well, we're both in Brooklyn. Yeah. And then Becca can start with her favorite cities. My favorite cities are Shanghai, Hong Kong, and Tel Aviv. My favorite cities are Mexico City and Medellin, Colombia. Wow. Okay. To- totally different vibes. I like mm-hmm. it. And what's your best concise advice for aspiring digital nomads? Um, having been an aspiring digital nomad, like even unbeknownst to me, I think great advice is that not everything is going to fall into your lap and you have to work for it. My advice is a little bit more on the practical side and it's pack less. Okay, we should talk about that. That's a good one. Uh, What small change has made a big difference in your life? Yes, I actually was writing, okay, I'm turning this not into rapid fire anymore, but I was writing a pitch to a journalist yesterday about this. A, A huge change that made a difference in my life was that I stopped shopping for frivolous things in 2017. And my small change is trying to have some consistency, make a routine, but don't always feel like you're locked to that specific routine. I like it. Those are both good ones. What is your favorite book? I'm I'm not really a a great reader, and it's something that I'm trying to focus on in 2022. I got a Kindle. I have some book recommendations, but I have been listening to a lot of audiobooks when I was running, and it's a little silly, but if you like audiobooks and you're looking for something to sort of occupy the time, it's an interesting story. The book, What I Talk About When I Talk About Running, is a really interesting book. And my book is called What We Were Promised. It's very good, although the title is, I guess, a little forgettable. But... <laughs> And if you had 20 seconds to live, what message would you share with the world? Drink more coffee. Travel more. I like it. I like it. Okay, awesome. Well, that's that's the end for our rapid fire. Now we can go into into normal fire, whatever we call it. Um, but it, it's good to ha- have you guys on here. I'm excited that we're doing this. And I'd love to maybe just start for anyone who's not familiar with you two as individuals with Half Half Travel. Give us an, an overview of your, your digital nomad story and journey, how it started, what you're up to now, like paint the broad picture for us. Okay, I think I'll go first and then I'll pass to Dan. So I, as a college student, traveled abroad in Hong Kong where I traveled to like 10 countries in Asia when I was 20 and 21 years old. So that for me was like the the kicker moment. Then after college, I moved completely on my own with a job that I had gotten online um, to Shanghai where I lived for two years and traveled more for two years on my own with people I'd met, like there, the world was my oyster, there was no limit. And I came back and I got a job in New York and now I'll pass it down. So my journey started in 2016 when, yeah, 2016, Jan- January 1st, 2016, I went on a trip to Columbia and it was seven days. And the group I was with was going on this like bigger month long itinerary. And uh, in Columbia, we went like kind of up and hugged the coast from north like traveling uh-huh. eastwards <laughs> yeah and i had to go all the way back down and it was like the worst because it was two long buses it was a story in and of itself but they kept going and it was super interesting because they were freelancing they were kind of working remotely but they kind of had jobs where they didn't really need to be on like on site so they were able to kind of take extended time off i thought it was super interesting and then when i got back i talked to my coworker and i was like I probably could have stayed and found co-working space or a cafe to work from or something like that. And she's like, well, there's this program called Remote Year. It was brand new at the time. There was only one, the original group was still traveling and it was still very new, but her friend was on it and she told me about it. And then I applied and got in. So this, that was my first real like journey into traveling because before I didn't really travel that much. So I traveled and worked remotely and learned a lot in that year since I was 
doing it and didn't really have any research before. And we had met four months before that. And so we started dating long distance rather than giving up on like having dated for only five months. Yes. So there's a lot of new experiences at once, which was really interesting and exactly what I was looking for at the time. And the reason why I kind of wanted to travel to sort of break the break the consistency that I had that I really wanted to try to change and try to find something new. And yeah, so had that, came back to New York, stayed for a year. Becca and I went on another year-ish long trip. And well, then- it, there was a lot more work that went into that than just like doing this. But oh, yeah. Dan came back and we moved in together in Brooklyn. We got our first place together. And then nine months later, Dan convinced me that I, and I agreed, it was time to quit my job. And while we, you know, didn't have property, kids, or any other type of dependence, we should just travel with no plan. So we did. So we did. And then we came back to New York and then subletted, subletted rented a place, and then rented another place. So and, yeah. we've moved a lot, sold a lot over the past four years. And COVID happened sometime oh, in yeah. there, and we didn't leave the country until just six weeks ago. But... I think something interesting to point out is that while we were on the 10 month like bender around the world, just like being nomads with no plan, um, we had also gotten a lot of traction from our blog in the months before that, which gave us the confidence that like, we need to just like go and create and be inspired and meet people and help like, there was really no visualization for it, but we had this blossoming website and we already had the Instagram traction. We were getting some attention from brands on there. And so all these things culminated into us taking the the big trip with no plan. And somewhere, actually when we were in the Canary Islands, we got like an email from someone at Remote Year in the media management side of things who invited us to come on Remote Year for four months during our 10 months away from home. We also have this experience of doing nomading like completely on our own, like with no plan, you know, finding the next cafe, finding the next Airbnb. What do you do when the Wi-Fi goes out? And also being with Remote Year and Dan doing it alone and then us doing it as a couple for a shorter amount of time, having the apartment set up, having roommates, having the travel day set in stone. You know you're leaving Medellin on November 29th, but it is, everybody goes. And then having the co-working set up for you when you get to the next place. And it was all, I mean, it was all great experiences, but there's absolutely two ways to be a nomad. Cool. Yeah. I, I agree with recently interviewed another person who did remote year and started there and then since has done some traveling on his own. And Eric. it seems like a great way. Yeah. Yeah. Eric. Yeah. yeah, yeah. A mutual connection. I forgot. Right. Right. Sh- shout out. Shout out the nomad on fire podcast. And yeah, we, we talked about it's interesting. It feels like a great way to get going and to have built in community as you travel. So shout out mm-hmm. to remote year and definitely check that out for anyone who's interested. I want to focus a little bit on your blog and your Instagram for anyone who's not familiar. I really like your Instagram where a lot or if not all you can correct me here have that the half and half photo style where it's it's one of you guys on one side and one on the other side and getting my story correct here it started during the long distance time and you guys were each documenting half and i think it's a really just interesting concept uh and yeah i I love it it's unique i hadn't seen it before so tell us a little bit more about the beginning to the evolution and what's happening there sure this is typically where I tell the story, if that's okay. Yeah, it was, it was her idea, so she can tell the story. So when Dan left, um, it was... When, when Dan left New York, it was May 2016, and we actually weren't sure at the time, like before he was leaving, if we were going to stay together. So one of my best girlfriends and I booked a trip to Africa because I was like, well, I don't know when I'm going to get to see Dan and like, just we're going to go. We want to take this trip. So Dan started his trip in like the Czech Republic and then he was in London and I was in Africa. And so we were like, oh, we have all this content. And over the months, I was thinking like, you know, when am I going to see him next? We had to plan our next trip together. I, I did wind up visiting him in Portugal four months after I had last seen him. And sometime in that that like gray area, I was like, well, it would be great if like, you know, we stay together these 12 months and we have a project to work on because we're both photographers. We're both really creative. Instagram was like becoming a bigger thing at the time. This was 2016. So like those big accounts that like now are like massive accounts were kind of just like starting to, people were figuring out how to follow like people they wanted to follow. And so I actually had seen that there was this other couple that like years back, I think 2014 had done this like half, half series, but they gave up on it. 
So I was like, we should do like a half half series. You know, he's he's gonna be in Argentina. He's gonna be in Colombia. And I I'm in New York. And every time I visit him, we're gonna have more photos. And so we we started this like grid of you know just like nine photos of like half and half a coffee, half and half our feet, half and half something. And Dan reached out to a reporter on Twitter who who said this is great, and he published an article about us. And after that article, we got picked up by A Plus dot com, which is all, uh, Ashton Kutcher's news website. Oh, is it? Yeah. And then from there, we got an interview from Oprah. Doc, not actual Oprah, but like Oprah.com. And we were in print in Oprah. And from there, some crazy things happened. We were in Travel and Leisure, Condé Nast, um, Matador Network, Lonely Planet. And then the day I went to visit him in Argentina the next April, we got an email to our shared email address. And I was on a layover in Panama. And there was an email from a French reporter in France. And they said, we want to buy one of your photos. And like, here we were, me in an airport in a, in a like priority pass lounge. And Dan was like in his co-working space in Cordoba, Argentina. And we were like, what do we do? So we like came up with a file and like, they just wanted to pay us like immediately so that they could print our photo and, and have the rights to it or whatever. So we've had a few of those since, but that was the first really exciting time. And we've been in the news in Germany and we've, it's, it's spiraled. So that's where the traction came from. But at some point in that, like area of the the bursting of the Instagram. I had been writing like short guides to all my travels for years. Cause you know, I would go to Guatemala, I would go to Nicaragua and my friends would say, hey Becca, like, you know, what did you do there? Could you tell me? So I had this like stash of Google docs where I was just detailing the stuff I did after a trip, like for the next friend. And the one that got the most like views, not that you can count this with Google Docs, but after I spent two years in Shanghai, I wrote something called like Becca's Guide to Shanghai. And I started kind of ballparking how many people had seen it. And it was like in the 50s and 60s. So I was like, something about what I'm doing is people want to see this. And so we started our website and we started writing guides to like some of the first places we had been together, which were Portugal, Colombia, Argentina. And then we went to Hong Kong, we went to Sri Lanka. We started writing these and then like, we didn't know much about SEO at the time, but our Hong Kong photo spot article got on page one of Google. And we were like, okay, we're doing something right. So like, can we do a few more things right? And then- it Took a long time. It took a while, but um, I think starting in, actually COVID gave us the most like bump to our viewership because we started writing work from home stuff since we already had the background of work remotely, we applied a lot of work remote stuff to working from home. And now we're just back into like the remote work and digital nomadic kind of content. Yeah. And those early travel guides are terrible. They're one of the worst articles we have on our website now. So we've been going back and updating them. The tricky part with travel guides is they get updated super fast, or they get outdated super fast, but there are some things that don't change. So it's been really interesting navigating those oldest articles, having not really been back to that place in four years. But, you know, like Becca said, it's given us a lot of opportunity to write more into remote work, write more into home and lifestyle, write a lot about photography and freelance advice and mm -hmm. things like that. So it's the, that first article that gave us traction was really the inspiration to keep going. And then we never really stopped in that, in that four year period. Amazing. Well, congrats on all the growth and success. I love, I love getting the full path and journey. Yeah. I think it's, it's interesting what you touched on a few different things. One was how a, a little bit of micro success leads you to push forward and keep testing and then that can grow and the aspect of looking back on your old work and thinking about how you don't think it's good and it's one of those things where it's like if you if your bar is too high in the beginning, like you never publish. Mm -hmm. uh, and so the iterative, the process of launching and then iterating on that, I feel like it's so important. And I don't know how you felt about the guide at the time, but but whether you think, oh man, this isn't perfect, I need to publish it, or this is perfect, I need to publish it. Like just getting it out there is so important to getting going. Yeah, and like at the time, those articles were the best thing in the world. We're like, these are better than everything else we've right. seen. But like now, now we go back to them and it's like, well, well, like, what were we thinking? That right. was terrible. Like it doesn't have proper headings and it's yeah. just like not long enough. It's not robust enough, but I don't know. People were viewing it at the time because it was helpful. So a lot of our takeaways from that were like, be helpful. But even now we will rather publish something than it being absolutely perfect. So like a great example is we went to Merida in Mexico and we have 
we kind of blocked out five potential articles to write and Becca's been writing them faster than I can edit photos. So what I did is I exported all of the unedited, unedited photos for her to choose from and then the photos that she selected, I'll edit them super quick. And I've gone back to those photos like a day later with fresh eyes and I'm like, these edits stink. So then what I'm gonna do is go back when I finalize the photo edits, I'm gonna replace them in the article. So, but it was important that, you know, that took me two weeks, that that article has been live for two weeks and then kind of collecting traction and things like that. So it's, it's important to push it out even if it's not perfect and continue to iterate is really the name of the game. I dig it, I like it a lot. Well, I wanna transition a little bit to your remote work lives. I feel like you guys have, have two different professional lives. You have the, the, the content creator side and then the remote worker side. For the average person listening, the, the biggest barrier to becoming a nomad is figuring out how to make money. I think, at least from my perspective, once you figure that out, figuring out the logistics, where to go, there's, there's details and, and there's uh, difficulties and things, but that stuff's definitely the easy part once you figure out how to make money. Um, take me through your journey of both becoming remote workers mm -hmm. um, and any thoughts you have for other people who are trying to get remote jobs or become remote workers. So I think, well, definitely where we like started the conversation right before was that Dan went on remote year, which was a predetermined itinerary and a flat fee per month from him as the participant in the program. And Remote Year does a great job of picking really varied places, most of them where the cost of living is not too high, although there is like a variation in the end for that. But when we were able to make all those decisions on our own for our almost a year spent like nomading, um, if it had been all up to me, we would have spent time in like the lowest cost of living countries. One thing people might soon realize is like, sure, you can spend like $6 a day in Myanmar and in India and like Bangladesh and places like that, but you're not gonna get great Wi-Fi. And the cost of great Wi-Fi is so like priceless at the end of the day. I did try working in Myanmar when we were there. Like I had to sign on and do a little of work and it's just painful. Like it's not the, you know, high speed, whatever you're used to like at home or in a, a like a verified co-working space. So I think that's one of the lessons that you might learn like really quickly when you start nomading. We got pretty lucky. We started this, um, this like year together traveling in Europe where we didn't have problems at all, but Europe comes at a much higher price, which for me is really scary because if if we go back to what I said about where I started my travels, it was in East Asia and Southeast Asia. And like, I, I think a meal should cost $2. I think accommodation should be $9 a night. Like this is my baseline. So I'm, I'm on your team, by the way. I know you are. <laughs> just, so we're, just so we're clear here. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So we, we were in Europe, which was great to see friends. And that's like, you know, invaluable, priceless. We saw friends we hadn't seen in a really long time. And we got to, we actually did spend some time in the cheaper parts of Europe, dare I call them cheap, but like, you know, objectively, we went to Latvia, we went to Lithuania, we went to the Czech Republic and like just putting the numbers on paper of what a meal costs in each compared to like dinners out we had in uh, whatever, the Netherlands and even like Lisbon is getting expensive. Like it's just, it's night and day. So we went to South America, that was great. And then when we really had like the final choices of where to spend time, we went to Vietnam for a month, huge, you know, bang for the buck. I mean, quality of living, like debatable, a lot of pollution, a lot of people, but like awesome travel experiences. And then we went to Taipei where we mostly had good Wi-Fi when we were in cafes, but not in our Airbnb. So like trade off, you make it work. I think back to your question, like, like how did we start making money? I took a really big risk by like quitting my job. And then I wound up getting hired back as a remote part-time worker, which like kind of just paid the bills. And then together we started like putting a lot more time into the blog, hoping that we would get somewhere someday, which eventually we did, but it took more time than just that year of like nomading alone. Yeah, so for me, when I first started traveling in 2016, I was able to work remotely at my full-time job. So that was probably the easiest thing, but back in 2016, it was a little hard because not everybody was allowing that. It wasn't really as common. I think for anybody starting now, it's pretty easy because a lot of jobs are remote first anyway. Like my office closed down because it didn't make sense to keep it. And a lot of people moved away to be closer to family or kind of have a new change of pace wherever they are or, or however it made sense. But that's like since COVID. Yeah, so that, that's a new thing now that I think is in people's benefits for trying to start. But then the interesting thing is 
in that initial trip that I took that, that year away, halfway through, I quit and then I started working freelance. But in order to do that, I had two significant contracts lined up already in motion that I know that I knew that would continue to allow me to travel, like pay, pay the bills and then save a little bit, have enough for spending. And then anything, any new clients I picked up along the way were, you know, additional income, things that I can use for saving or buying something new, things like that. So that was a, a really big step in my professional growth. And then I continued freelancing all the way through the rest of our time traveling and even being back in New York. So our second trip, I freelanced for the client, but then it was, a, it was mutually a good time to not work for that client anymore. And then I kind of picked up small freelancing things and then also made the intentional decision to invest a lot into working on our website, even though it wasn't profitable yet. And it took a little while to get profitable, but it was it was worth the investment. But also those smaller freelance projects that I was working on at the time were enough to fund our travel to get through. So there's kind of two ways to go about it, you know, working full time or working for yourself, working on something that you believe will, you know, pay in the longer run. So there's a couple of different ways to think about it. Yeah. Yeah, I I generally really like like the approach or how you phrase it where, where you talked about like freelancing to pay the bills while you invested in the site. And I've, I mean, I've been traveling for five years now, haven't really done much freelancing stuff, honestly, because I just struggled to get like hired. Like I couldn't figure out how to, my skills are very entrepreneurial and I couldn't mm -hmm. figure out how to piece it together in a freelance way. But I think the the mentality of not wanting to the trap that we all see is like trading your time for money and when you can invest your time into like long-term assets that's when you really break from that and i think that what you referenced which is figuring out how can i make enough while like cutting carving out enough of my time to really invest and nurture this thing even mm -hmm. before it was clear from what you said it wasn't necessarily clear that uh that it was going to be a big winner or you just had you had faith and you were excited about it so you invested that time to try to get it over that hump and i think yeah i think that's just a really really key piece so i wanted to highlight like that to anyone who's listening. Well, one other thought, which is something that you brought up, uh, Dan, in the intro, which is about packing. So give me your thoughts. You said pack less. I think that was your advice. Give me your thoughts on packing. I can I start with Dan, but I'd love to hear from both of you. Yeah. So, I mean, when I when I left for a year, I think I started, I think I wanted to do carry on only because I don't know, I didn't have a lot of travel experience prior, but I didn't really want the risk of not having my bag. I don't really remember why I felt that way. So then I spent a lot of time and a lot of research trying to find really intentional items to really fill a, a sized bag that will only, only fit in the overhead. And kind of that early thinking and all the experimentation has like been really rewarding because now when, wherever we go, I, I'm comfortable with everything that I bring and it's not a lot. So it's like, and I traveled with like a computer, camera, a bunch of lenses. You traveled with two computers in 2018. For a brief period, <laughs> which is super annoying. Oh, really and two heavy. cameras? I think I had two cameras, a bunch of lenses. Like I had a lot of electronic things in very little clothes. So it's like a dream whenever. So when I'm going on this trip to Puerto Rico in a week, I'm super excited because I'm probably not going to bring a computer and I'm not going to bring a camera. So I'm like, my bag's going to be like empty because you really need like one shirt per day. You need one pair of pants, one pair of shorts, maybe. And, you know, socks and underwear. But yeah, like, definitely, that, definitely bring shorts here, by the way. It's hot. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. But like, that's it. And then everywhere we go, we usually end up doing laundry if we're there for more than a week. And if for some reason you forget something or you need something, like it's super easy to go to a pharmacy or like wherever you are, there's things, there's things to help you because locals are there doing the same thing. So mm -hmm. it's really rare, unless you're going camping or something. Yes. But it's really rare that you won't be able to find something you need and the things that are really important to you and that you value, like hold on to those things and identify what those are. And then that's that's your bare essentials. And I think I, think I did this before I left, before I had the experience, but pack a bag, live out of it for a week while you're still home and kind of feel if that's the right move and if, you've, if you feel like you've packed the right things. 
That's a good idea. I like that. I hadn't thought about that, but that's yeah. Yeah. that's a good nugget. The other thing that like sticks out to me from, you know, the, the difference in experienced travelers who know that like, okay, if you go away for two weeks, you really only need what you need for one week because somewhere in there, you'll have your laundry done either in a washer by yourself or you'll, you know, go to a laundromat where there's a service. Like laundry is a real thing that exists everywhere. When Dan was on remote year, he has funny stories about people who just brought like the things you would not expect to find in someone's luggage, like... A Vitamix or, I don't know, some people brought like two 50 pound suitcases. It was, when you travel with a lot of people, everybody has a a bunch of different styles. And there was this thing where like, someone's like, hey, I'm overweight. Does somebody have any weight to spare so we can like distribute it? Because if you're over 50 pounds, you have to pay on some airlines. So it was like, you're bringing like 100 pounds plus worth of things. It was like, it was crazy to me. And then when we were on this four month remote year trip together, because we had just been like, on our lonesome for four months before that, from June to September, whatever, you know, just like we each have like a 50 liter bag. We each have like a 25 pound front pack. And like, that's, that's it. You also like in my mind, one of my biggest lessons learned over the years is you should always be able to walk a mile with whatever you packed because we got off a bus in like Jerusalem (laughs) and I was like, well, the hostel's a mile away. And we were like, well, I guess like we couldn't figure out what bus to take. We couldn't find like a Uber or taxi. And I was like, you know, whatever. It's like 60 degrees out. You want to just walk. And we're like, yeah. Yeah, it's like 20 minutes. You should always be able to walk with all your stuff on your on your back and your front. So that's like my my number one rule. If my backpack's too heavy, take something out. And like, if something's uncomfortable, like just remember, you might have to walk a mile. The other thing that I will never forget is similarly to Dan's story about people with like overweight was when we would get off, like, I guess like our, you know, transport to the airport in, uh, during remote year, the four month one, um, there were some ladies some women in our trip who just had like the extra large size suitcase like and a carry-on suitcase and a backpack first of all can't walk a mile with it second of all i was like you're acting like there are no washing machines in all of south america like why why do you and people just brought shoes and like jewelry and like a selection of coats and and like here i was just like okay i have like nine shirts and like there's a washer, you know? Like there's just totally two ways to think about it. And people, myself included, if I like can't decide, I'll bring both of something. Usually it's a dress. But, um, you know, if you haven't left home for more than two weeks at a time, you're just like, what if I, X, Y, Z? What if I, you know, can't, I don't know. Everybody wants to have their closet at their fingertips when they're away for a while, because it's like like a daunting idea. Yeah, it's like, what if it rains? Oh, what if it's gonna snow? Oh, wait, what if I wanna go to this nice dinner? So like, like, don't bring those what ifs, I think is what we're saying. Or use other things yeah. to, to go to that nice dinner. Yeah. yeah. I, so I'll say on my own nomading journey, I've actually switched sides on this topic where when I started, I was on the one carry on bag. Like everything was in a 50 liter bag. Uh huh. And now, although I, I will qualify this statement by saying I could walk a mile with all my stuff. And I actually, I was thinking I like about that. it because I was looking for. I couldn't find a rental car shuffle shuttle and I was like thinking about just walking but I've got a 50 liter carry on and now I've got like a 50 pound check bag Mm -hmm. and I travel with multiple surfboards so I'm checking (gasps) I'm checking two bags everywhere I go but Uh, you stay a lot longer yeah Yeah. you're really living when I started I was switching every four to eight weeks mm-hmm. and now I'm doing like four to six months. Yeah, um, it's so it's totally different. it's different. And there's just different I guess I have become like a creature of habit. I'm still consider myself a minimalist for sure. And I only have eight of the same shirts and two pairs of shorts. But most of my stuff is like I have a ring light, which I consider really important. That is really important. And I have like a few a few different nuanced things that I that I now like uh I, I travel with a skateboard which I stick into my into my checked bag so I have wow. like I've I have definitely I've I've switched sides yeah which I guess highlights that there's there's different styles I mean I've met mm-hmm. I've met the people who have the multiple I mean I do have multiple carry-ons but who have multiple carry-ons like filled with clothes and I think ultimately whatever whatever you need go for it Dan to your point like whatever you need to buy 
you can usually get wherever you're going, especially if it's like, you know, soap, pharmacy stuff, yeah. like yeah. you can mm -hmm. find that stuff everywhere. Yeah, like I actually never really travel with soap or shampoo because uh, it's because such a- I do. <laughs> well, because Becca does. <laughs> but if, if, uh, if she didn't, like our Airbnb had like uh, the soap and shampoo like uh, yeah. thing. And then like, if you stay in a hotel, like they always give it to you. And yeah. then it's like, for me, it's the hassle of like, and it's the risk. Like I don't really, I don't really want the risk of it spilling or whatever. But then, but yeah. But to to your point of traveling with all those things, it's like it makes sense because it improves your quality of life. Being able to have your surfboard, being being able to have your skateboard, your ring light, all the things that are important to you. Right. And I think for people that travel with a lot of clothes, there's really nothing wrong with it. That's what makes them happy to have the variety in clothes. I think it's mm -hmm. like knowing the potential hassle of every, every time you move, it's kind of a, a challenge or, you know, not being able to walk a mile if you have a Vitamix. Sorry, Montre, if you're listening to this. <laughs> <laughs> she also traveled with like a power converter or something because- Of the Vitamix? Yeah, because you needed a transformer with the Vitamix. Got it. It's pretty crazy. Yeah, but I yeah, actually I mean, got, yeah. for my checked bag, because of Bali, I actually got it with backpack straps. So I, it's like a 110 liter checked bag, but it, it can be used as a backpack if you need to, which I actually have. So you're like, like, I'm a backpacker? <laughs> I mean, I could be. I, I rode on a scooter with it. I had my one backpack on the front and I had this 110 liter checked wow. bag oh, on my, my back. God. And then I have the surfboards on the side in the rack. So I can, it fits on a scooter, I could walk. Yeah. That's also different because, okay, a skateboard's a mode of transport by all means, and then surfing's your hobby. I mean, it's the same if you were the guy walking into the hospital, we've all been there with the guitar. There's always the guitar guy. There used to be. I don't know For if people sure. do this anymore. Sure. I mean, in the golden days they, of like- I, I, They must, they must. They yeah. exist. Well, I want to shift to talk about Merida, Mexico and doing a deep dive there. But before we get there, I have kind of one one last question on the the personal finance and minimalism side. From what I gathered before in our, our pre-conversation, you guys live like a pretty minimalistic life in New York City. Tell me about your journey with minimalism and and applying that to New York City. Give me give me yeah. the, the rundown here. So I think a lot of people think that it cannot be done. Um, just because, for example, I follow the, I follow this personal finance blogger who lives like in a suburb of Cincinnati. Um, <laughs> he he recently like crapped on New York for saying it's a high cost of living city and like you need a higher salary and like all these things. And in the comments, people are like crapping on New York. But I'm like, if you live in the suburbs of Cincinnati, how bored are you? So everyone who lives in a high cost of living city knows that there's tons of things to do. Everything is at your fingertips. And one more thing, you don't need a car. So what I perceive about our lifestyle here, and I never really like thought about it until I got into like these personal finance fire click holes, is that we are just like, we don't have as many set expenses as people who own cars, need car upkeep, have house upkeep, like all these things. Like we pay our rent and yes, our rent is double what it would be in Cincinnati, but all the things we have at our fingertips are like really incredible. And all our friends are here. We have friends within walking distance. Um, there's beautiful parks, there's culture, there's, you know, in the summer, like it's just an unbelievable place to be and you can like eat anything from anywhere in the world. So, so for all those reasons, we just like, and we cook a lot. So we keep our costs down. We live the lifestyle we want to. We're not like lavish, but you know, we're happy. And I think like, just like New York or like San Francisco is really daunting to people who don't actually tally up like their fixed costs at home. Yes. And I think what Becca said is really important where we rent. So, and you can rent anywhere, but we don't have a car and that's kind of our fixed expenses. Like our rent is really the only thing that's like expensive, but everything else I think subsidizes it. So not having a car, not paying for insurance, not paying for gas is a huge deal. And then also New York, I think has a range of expensiveness that I think isn't always understood. So we shop at groceries and our groceries are usually cheaper than places we travel, for example. Like when we yeah. were in Mary to Mexico, we went to the grocery store and it was kind of more expensive than here for certain things. You know, New York has so many people that the cost is down for certain things. You can go to, you know, Whole Foods and spend, you know, $4.99 for apples, but like where we go shopping for produce is more affordable because of 
um, I don't know. Just like supply. Yeah, supply. the the supply and, and, and the volume they're producing. And yeah. also like... Eating stuff that's in season. Yeah. Eating local. Yeah. Um, we keep vegetarian in the home, which has been really awesome since like 2019, 2020. We've had like much more vegetarian, vegan tendencies. So we don't have to watch the price of meat go up and down. Like we yeah. love that. And something interesting is there's... Like we sell a lot of our things pretty frequently. So if we realize we're not using it, we'll sell it. And living in New York, there's always somebody to buy it locally. So on Facebook Marketplace or Craigslist, or we ship it out, but there's there's a lot of people. And if you need something and you wanna order it secondhand, there's a lot of people selling things too. And there's a lot of people giving away things. Yes. So, you know, if you kind of find your pocket, it's really easy to sort of save a lot of money living here. And then I think the biggest thing is rent, having roommates or- Or just living like- with somebody else. Yeah, and like as a couple, I mean, yeah, we each like, we not split rent, but like our rent is for two people. So neither of us has ever lived in a studio or a one bedroom and like stomached the whole foot of the bill on our own. So I think like we have a pretty good deal. We get pretty good value for like the building we live in. We got, we actually got a really good deal by renting like before the vaccines came out and the world kind of changed like within a day. Um, we have a rooftop, we have a gym, we have a doorman, we have a pool room. Billiards, not a swimming pool, but I don't know. I think we probably live a better life than like people elsewhere. Well, before we shift to Merida, last question is, are there any thoughts, advice, anything you want to share with people on any of the topics we've discussed or anything else? Any 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 final thoughts to share? I don't know. I feel like there's so much to be said about us as a couple, like agreeing on all these things that not completely mainstream. How many of our friends are like, oh yeah, I'm a minimalist or like I'm, we don't have friends who really like take a dive and go work remotely for a month. Aside from our travel friends and our remote year friends in New York and like all the friends I've met traveling who are a pretty big part of my life, like friends I've met in the past 10, 15 years, just like in hostels around the world who have helped make me who I am. But I don't know, like our friends from high school and college, like don't really do what we do. Um, so we're kind of like, I don't know, like the special outliers most of the time, like, oh, how did you do it? How were you away for so long? Like, how did you make money when you were so far from home? Like, how is it possible? So I don't know, a lot of explaining over the years, but I think we're really both grateful, like as a, a duo, as a couple to have like these outlets of meeting people like you, Cam, and like Eric and all other people who just like understand us, even if we're not in the same place at the same time. But I think, I think that advice with that said would be if you're interested in something try to pursue it so don't always be oh it'd be great if i could or wouldn't it be nice if i could do it? like if you're really interested in something i think the difference uh, th that we make is we are we have an interest in something we research it and then we do it so i think like for anybody that's on the fence of personal fine like uh having success in personal finance or trying to figure out how to work and travel if, you, if it's something you're interested in, do the research, like listening to this podcast or reading our blog or a blog or a book, and then go try it. And then you, you'll you know if it's for you, if you try it and you like it. Yeah, I love that. Learning learning by doing and that the the difference between making it happen and not, and not is just action. It's like literally mm -hmm. taking the steps. I love that. Sweet. Well, let's let's shift over and let's do a deep dive on Merida, Mexico for digital nomads. So for anyone who's thinking about going to Merida for, let's say, one to six months and everything they need to know, mm -hmm. uh, give us your, your crash course. You guys were just there for a month and a half. Is that right? Almost a month. Almost a month. We definitely could have stayed longer. It yeah. felt like home. We had we had our laundry guy. We had our grocery store. I had my haircut spot. We yeah. It was easy to make it feel like home very fast. We felt very comfortable yeah. there. It's very livable there. Yeah. Give me your give me your general thoughts, pros and cons. Give mm -hmm. us the overview here. Okay. I think when we talk about cons, I know exactly where we're going to go. But for pros, so Merida is, and in Spanish, Merida. So it has an accent on the E, so you get an emphasis on the first syllable. So people don't pronounce it Merida, because that's not correct. It is the 12th biggest city in Mexico. And I have been like referring to it as the 12th biggest city in Mexico that people have never heard of. Because people have heard of Puerto Vallarta, Acapulco, Cancun, Mexico City, maybe Monterrey, Tijuana, and like, I don't know. 
but everyone has those places in Mexico where they've heard of. Most people think Mexico is just this place with kind of like five major cities. Merida is, it has almost a million people and it's located on the Yucatan Peninsula, which is that kind of like thumb that goes into the Gulf of Mexico where it's, I don't know, I don't want to say a stone's throw, but like the closest other body of land is Cuba, I think. So it has like this tropical feel, although Merida is not on the water. It's like a 40 minute drive from the New Year's beach, but you can get there in a taxi or an Uber like and we, we did. Um, it's very hot. It has a really nice downtown with a colonial boulevard that was like modeled after Paris and Spain. And it has these mansions from the late 1800s. Some of them even look like they were just plopped out of Europe. And then the rest of the place is like colorful buildings. There's a, a street grid. So the whole city is kind of like in a, a grid, like um, checkers. There's a lot to do. There's like a great little, called the Centro Historico. So like the historic center where there's a big plaza um, with museums, there's art, there's galleries, there's shopping, there's a big city market. Um, there's a lot of expats and nomads. There's a lot of great places for coffee and cafe and like beautiful food. And there's the Yucatan cuisine, which is a lot of stewed meats and oranges and turkey and some vegetables and really cool spices like achayote. Um, and then we were able to find really great co-working at really what seems like the only co-working space in the city, but with no complaint, the Wi-Fi was incredible. Like my coworkers back home in New York were like, wow, your Wi-Fi is fast. Like when I did screen shares and there's a lot of meetups for expats from what we could see. So that was really cool. In terms of cons. I guess I'm on the hook for the cons. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I knew what you would get at first, though, if, if I know what you're going to say. I have no idea. So, I mean, oh. it's, it's, so a pro is it's really nice and warm and hot. I think it's also a con. Yes. So there's, there's the best time to go is in the Northern Hemisphere winter. Mm -hmm. So like maybe no, November to March, November to March is really the best time to go. It gets pretty hot still. It's like, it could be in the nineties. Mm -hmm. It could go down to the seventies if it's cloudy. So, and the sun isn't super strong during that time too. So we never really got burnt. And yeah. we didn't try too hard, so that, I think that's a pro. That's a pro. Yeah. But in in the summer, it's like a hundred and humid, and it's like pretty hot. So you, there's not really a lot of walking around during the day. I think all your activities are going to be in the early morning or at night. Um, we heard from a local that you'll go grocery shopping at like six in the morning. And that's pretty common because it's like really hot. Um, and that's from May to September. Yeah. So if you live there full time, uh, you get used to it. You find your routine. That's part of life there. I think another con is the sidewalks are oddly small, but it's not really a con. But it was more of an observation from when we walk from when we were walking around. Really, again, not not a huge deal, but like cars go by pretty fast, so it's something to know when you go there. For vegetarians or people that are vegans, I think it's a little challenging. Um, you could absolutely find things and find restaurants. There's, there's, there are a ton of restaurants that offer it, but if you're looking for more of a local authentic experience, I think there aren't a ton of options. At least that's what we found. Like the cuisine, the local cuisine and the specialties are innately carnivorous, carnivorous. Yes, so we, went <laughs> to a local, we yeah. went to a local taco market a few times and there's like one thing that's vegetarian. Yeah. It like probably technically wasn't, like, I don't know, things, <laughs> things, things that have beans, like I know have pork, like fat in it. And I like look the other way because I know it, but it's- You gotta survive, you gotta eat. It's what right. it is. So on the other hand, there are like a lot of places that are like new wave, like vegan friendly, like I guess like clean eating places like that. But you're not gonna, if you wanna eat authentically and experience like the culture firsthand, you're probably gonna run into things that are just made with lard. Cause yeah. it's cheaper than butter and- It's what it is. Yeah. And then I think for working, there is a great co-working space, but there's one. And depending on where you're choosing, the, so Merida is like pretty big. It's kind of like LA where it's they're- It's that big, but it sprawls. But, it's, but you mean it's, where it's like, it's it sprawls out. Like yeah. It, it's, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And so, it has like a very defined center of town. Like that's the center of town. It's non-negotiable. Everything just kind of convenes. Yes, yeah, so everything at, like, and there's, there's like a ring road. Everything's kind of like in that. And then there's also things a little outside. So if there is one co-working space that's like, like I think there are there are others, but there it's like someone's house or it's like it's small. So what, if you the, really want, what's the name of the one, the one and only? Conexion sixty. C O N E X I O N six zero. Yeah. So if you're living in a farther farther suburb in Merida, it's going to be a little. It might take you 15, 20 minutes to drive there or take a bike. We intentionally picked our 
places that we were staying that were within a 10 minute walk because we knew it was going to be hot. Mm -hmm. And we knew that we didn't want to walk 20 or 30 minutes. Um, we didn't want an hour commute to work every day. And that was the best decision we made because it was, it made us very con feeling conducive to go there. And if we forgot something, it wasn't a big deal to go home and go get it. And so we were under a 10 minute walk from there, wherever we stayed. Yeah. So I think that's, that's a con is there's, there's kind of one. So if you're, if that's a really big, important thing and you're not going to be renting a car or you don't have a bike, it, it kind of limits where you can stay a little bit. And then another potential con is we had a little trouble finding markets, but that's not to say they don't exist. It's more of the area where we were staying didn't have a lot of local markets. So there wasn't a lot of like local produce that we usually like to, to find like street vendors in Peru have tons, tons of produce yeah. that are probably polluted, but. <laughs> but like you could like fill up <laughs> a, a tote bag of fruit in Peru for $3. Yeah. And like, we didn't see anyone really offering that in Merida. Yeah, there were a couple, but there were like, there, it was sort of hard to find. And then there's like the local center, which had a lot of the local market, like there are local markets, but from where we were staying, they were a little far. So yeah. like, it's our fault for choosing to be close to that co-working space. But then a side effect was like grocery stores with produce was a little hard to come by. Um, so we went to Walmart, which is like where everybody goes. Walmart's huge for groceries and yeah. for everything. It was pretty incredible. So it felt like inauthentic to us, but it was a Mexican Walmart. So they had like Mexican stuff. Like they had a ton of rice and beans and salsa and like, you know. There's like, an aisle that has salsa. That's yeah, it. The salsa aisle. I think that's it. No, I think you're going to say the other con was running. Uh, sort of, yeah. So a big part of travel for is trying to find a good place to run. And that like center boulevard that Becca was explaining, you can run there, it's fine. It's about one mile from the like start to the end. Uh, there's like a couple of intersections that could potentially take a little bit longer to cross. So it's not uninterrupted, but then there is a track that's really interesting. And it might be like a third of a mile all the way around maybe a little bit longer and it's like a gravel. Mm. So those are really the only options I found for running and it's- But on the plus side, Merida is at like zero altitude. Yeah. So you don't get the altitude sickness that you might run into in Mexico City or like Guadalajara. I'm just making that up. I don't know how high it is, but Mexico City is like a high altitude city for most people. Yeah. So you didn't run into anything like that because it's like super flat. Yeah. So like other places we've traveled were like great for running. So like Portugal has like a really great running and biking path because it's right on the water or Lisbon. Li Lisbon. Mm -hmm. New York City obviously has a lot, you know, Ton. <laughs> because we live here now, we have a lot of running recommendations, but yeah. then, you know, it, it's not really a concern for everybody. It's really only a concern for someone that's like into running or training mm -hmm. for something, but it was something that we found as a little bit of a challenge to find distance trying to run somewhere. And the weather was pretty hot. So it was kind of challenging on both ends there. And how did, outside of the co-working space, how did you find the Wi-Fi in general? Yeah, great question. Um, so you worked at cafes more than I did. Yeah. Um, Apapacho is this great, like, woman-owned restaurant, like, like great, like, decor themed with books and, like, has vegetarian food and coffee and drinks and stuff. Um, you work there. Wi-Fi good? I didn't work there. I worked oh, at Starbucks. Okay, so Starbucks is, I know, grown but shout out, to, but shout out to Apapacho, though. Yeah, shout out to Apapacho. They're great. And they have Wi-Fi and people can work there. Yeah. We wrote um, a guide for, like, the best cafes and coffee shops in Merida. So you can find that on our website if you do want end up going to Merida. We didn't totally rate all the Wi-Fi at all these places, but one, um, but we did like note if people have reviewed that they can work there, like to work there, Wi-Fi is good. One nice thing about Merida is that in like very public spaces, like the main plaza and a lot of that main boulevard I mentioned, the city has a Wi-Fi network called Merida Digital and you can just connect it. And like, I actually worked on a park bench <laughs> on the boulevard and like, I did. Like, I didn't have a meeting or anything, but I was like on Slack shooting out emails just like from a park bench on the boulevard. So nice. that's a cool thing. Yeah, you can't find that everywhere. But yeah, I mean, in terms of like infrastructure, there is fast Wi-Fi there. It's more of a choice if wherever you're staying has that upgraded option. Um, you know, it's not like some places where you go where there like isn't infrastructure for fast Wi-Fi. It like, it exists there. And generally a lot of cafes that we went to we tested the Wi-Fi speeds and they were good. Mm -hmm. And then 
everywhere that we were staying had decent enough Wi-Fi to work. So it's like, I think for, for that concern, for anyone that's coming in, I think it's really not a problem. You can always find pretty fast Wi-Fi. Yeah. And then cost of living, uh, apartments, food, other things, what should people expect to pay and how does it compare to other places? Yeah, I can comment on that. So we did a ton of searching on Airbnb about where to stay. And we wound up staying at somewhere that was, I want to say basic because the place that we, we actually drew like a 10 minute radius around the co-working space again, because we wanted to be near there. So that kind of, I don't want to say limited us, but it made us focus more on like where I perceive to be super walkable and convenient to the co-working space. So we stayed somewhere that came out to an average of like 39 US a night. And that was with a few discounts because it, we stayed like more than two weeks. Um, that was our first place. So the only amenity I wish it had had was a washing machine. But as I was searching more and more, it's really rare for, I guess, apartments or like homes to have a private washer. So people just go out to laundromats. So I searched on Google for like laundromats and I found one that worked out for us. And it was this like great guy who charged us like two and a half dollars to, to wash like three kilos of clothes. So that worked out fine, just a little inconvenient because I had to walk like 12 minutes for it. But we had AC, we had Wi-Fi, the, ki the kitchen was usable. There was a fridge, there was a couch, there was a dining table. Um, we even had like outdoor space that we didn't use and like a pretty fine bathroom. So that's the kind of value you can get for under 40 US a night if you're staying somewhere to get like the, the weekly 10 or 20% off from the owner. Um, you can definitely go up a notch and like get a place with a yard, more space, more light, more character, private pool. That starts to cost about 100 US a night. Maybe a little less. Maybe a little less, depending yeah. on how long you stay. Because the, yeah. the place where we like really splurged for the weekend, we only did two nights. And then you, the cleaning fee is like applied and it's not divided by as many nights. So, and then if you come and you're cool with staying in a hotel, there are a lot of three and four star hotels. That and five. Can, and five that can come out to like really affordable prices by Western standards. Yeah. So, um, and then for people who are renting, I don't, I don't know what like a monthly rent would come out to, but probably yeah, like so, under a thousand US, I would think. Yeah, so one of our friends that rents there rents for about 1100 and it's a really nice place, like brand new and it has a lot of amenities. It has, I think two pools. It has like a lot of really interesting things. I think they pay 12 and 1300. I th yeah, but it's, it's, yeah, it's, it's something it's around It's like there. a whole three bedroom townhouse. Yeah, but it's, it's farther out of the center of Merida, but they have a car, so it works for them. So if you're kind of here for the long run, like, four months, five months, six months, you could rent and you could expect between a thousand and let's say 1200. Um, if you're doing the Airbnb, I think, yeah, like Becca's right. You can expect to spend an average of $40 per night. Um, you can probably negotiate with the Airbnb host if you want to stay for four weeks plus. Mm -hmm. That's usually a common thing. Um, There's also a lot of great hostels. They're all located near the city center, which happens to be 25 to 30 minutes from the co-working space. But there are a lot of cafes that dot the center and the central plaza. And some of the hostels are super nice. They all have pools so that you can cool off and the privates can run you anywhere between like 30 to 60 a night, depending on just like the level of boutique-ness. So that's a really cool option for people who don't mind a hostel experience. Yeah, and then other expenses, we found that cabs are super affordable. Mm -hmm. It was, we were surprised on some of the rates. I think it's probably one of the cheapest cabs that we've ever found, even cheaper yeah. than Mexico City. Like so. I, I was looking at our credit card bill and we got charged like $1.50 to take an Uber for like 10 minutes. Yeah, I so. think the Uber we took to the beach from the from where we were staying, I think was like 10 bucks. Wow. And it was like 30, yeah. it was like 30 minutes. We were just like tipping people like 18, 20, 30%. We were like here and take the change because like things were, I don't know, they deserve more than that. Yeah, so trans transportation I think is really affordable. You can walk everywhere, but you know, if. If it's hot and they'll take you 30 minutes and it's a $2 cab ride, I think it's like, it's worth it in that scenario. Mm -hmm. Food is relatively affordable. Um, if you eat local, it's pretty good. If you go to one of the like more Western, like vegetarian vegan places mm -hmm. or generally someplace like a little bit more upscale, dinners will run you like seven bucks, but it really depends on what you get. Oh, I was gonna say more. We mostly ate at places that were like mid range, like fast casual or just like cafe style, but like for dinner. And I think it came out usually to like eight to $10 per person for a meal and a drink, yeah, not and, alcohol, like a smoothie. Yeah, and then beer is like 
four bucks, mm -hmm. something like that. Mixed drinks and things like that are also around there. So it's it's relatively affordable. I think for, for being there long term, you can really see the value. I think it's it's a really great place to be for value. Right on, right on. Well, I appreciate the the full breakdown here. I think we'll we'll call it at that. For anyone listening who wants to follow your journey or get in touch with you guys, your website, your Mm -hmm. social media handles anything you want to shout out here yeah it's all half half travel so half half travel half half travel.com half half travel on instagram facebook twitter and pinterest and um yeah we have lots of travel guides lots of information for people who are aspiring to be remote workers and travel we outline our favorite cities for working remotely and everything you should pack um, and also how to do it as a couple. So follow along. Yeah, and feel free to DM us on any platform through our website, Instagram, wherever, Twitter, mm -hmm. and we'll be more than happy to reach out, answer your questions. Awesome, well, thank you guys for being here. Appreciate you.